Upon arrival, I met up with Derek and his buddy Caleb. Now, naturally, it snowed six inches the night before and it was super cold, but you can immediately tell that this is a car guy based on the full restoration going on in his garage. So, a lot of these haven't been moved in 30 plus years. Uh, mostly uh, British sports cars. Watch your head, it's kind of a low ceiling in here. Wow. So, uh, that was my grandfather's got the 46 CJ2A that he got. He was in uh, World War II. He got that when he came home. This is a 1950 MGTD my dad picked up uh, 1970 when he graduated high school. This is a TR4 that I bought for him a few years ago. He used to race one just like this, so I thought that'd be nice to give him that. That's another project. This is a V8 MGB that he built when he was my age. Uh, I just picked this one up not that long ago. Uh, 72 MGB. That's the, the newbie uh, that's been in here for a while. Uh, the, the most recent one I picked up, the uh, GT6 MGA, my Alpha GTV in the corner, and then a Spitfire all the way tucked in the back. Wow, this is nuts, man. And then I got a 260Z inside with uh, the 510 two-door. What year is this? That's a 73. It's a one owner car from California, uh, bought new in November 73, parked in 76, 18,000 miles on it. Wow. Oh, that's the That's not. While we gathered up the lights and tools to pull the GT6 out, you can clearly see Derek is a unique character and he's my kind of guy. Like the 20th time I've whacked my head already on this thing. First, he moved a bunch of spare parts, then pushed a car or two out of the way and kicked down a 2x4 support beam, which was marginally concerning, revealing the crusty paint and rusty wheels. Unsurprisingly, Derek, of course, had better spare wheels just lying around, so we installed those before its journey across the snow covered lawn. Once we pushed it outside, you could really see just how much junk was covering the paint, but beneath that, I could see that there was huge potential to be had. Next, Derek got his truck and pulled it around back to hook up the chain to the front of the GT6. Now, once we were all set, I went for a sled ride in the Triumph. Now, I'm plowing the snow and I'm trying to see around the disgusting windshield. This, by far, was a first for me. <laughs> As we made the turn around the house, the truck in front hit a piece of ice and then we started spinning our wheels and we couldn't go anywhere. So we ended up having to mow the lawn with our shovels, clearing a path to get some grip for the truck. After an hour or so of playing in the snow and pushing the Triumph, we got it near enough to the garage <sighs> to later use the winch. But then the truck got stuck, so we pushed that out of the way and worked on opening the garage door. <laughs> I got tired there for a minute. That's <laughs> Here, I'll hop in. I'm pulling you back for a minute. Hey, boy. Oh, hey. <laughs> Naturally, in true Derek fashion, the doors of the garage were actually screwed to the walls in this in-process garage build. Once everything was down, we towed it inside the gutted garage. Okay, so this is a 1973 Triumph GT6. It's the hatchback version of the Spitfire. I bought the car out of California. The original owner bought it in late November of 73 for his wife. She only got a chance to put 18,000 miles on it between 73 and 76. So the car's been sitting since 76. I purchased it. It went straight in the barn next to all the other cars you can see. We have a lot of cars, uh, mostly British, Japanese sports cars. I like Datsuns, he likes MGs and Triumphs. Uh, he had one just like this when he was my age. Um, and I actually remember he used to take me to school in it. Same color, same year, same everything about it. So when this thing came up for sale, I knew I had to have it. So I bought it sight unseen out of California, had it shipped straight here. In the barn she went, 
and I just decided it was time to, uh, to get it out and start working on it, and uh, I'm sure he's going to love it. After a quick tour of the car, now that it's out of the barn, you can really appreciate the level of dirt that has accumulated after all these years and how dry rotted the seals were and so on. So we started the cleaning process with Frothy, not just because of the worn out seals, but because we were in a freezing cold garage with no water. So we did what we could under the circumstances. To get started, Dan and I first pushed the car in the middle of the garage for more working space and then used the Pro Foamer to soak the paint without having access to water. Perfect for washing cars in winter when the hoses are put away, or in this case, when it's a gutted garage and there's no heat, there's no water, there's no hose, that sort of thing. Even after a few preliminary wipes, the paint underneath started to come alive, so we were getting really excited. But keep in mind, it was about 15 degrees outside and maybe about 30 degrees inside the garage, so we asked Derek if he could get a small propane heater just to maintain 30, 35, a little bit above freezing so that we could be comfortable throughout the job. Cold. All right, after a quick test here, you can see we're at about 4.5. The range on this vehicle has been about two and a half the low and six the high. So I think we have a little bit of room uh, to work on the paint. It's single stage paint. There's gonna be a ton of residue coming off, as you know, most likely gonna be using a red Meguiar's foam pad. Uh, that's one that we use on airplanes and we use on boats that have tons of chalky paint. So I think underneath this, it's gonna look pretty good. But in the meantime, Derek, the owner is gonna come in. We're gonna jack the car up. We're gonna take all the wheels off and back there, he's got his own little body shop kind of thing going on there. So he's gonna clean those up. So I'm excited for that surprise. Then we'll go inside, clean the wheel well at the same time but in the meantime Dan and I are going to be polishing the rest of this for the next couple of hours so let's get to it. Next Derek lifted the car to remove the wheels and he brought them back to his body shop for a quick sand and repaint while Dan used the steam machine in the tight spots that would normally be easily removed with a power washer let's say but again at this location and temperature it's just not a realistic option but we made it work. Once the car was as clean as we could get it, we polished with a red foam pad and yellow polish. And look at the finish after just one pass. Night and day difference. All right, now check this out. I just did about half the hood here. Exactly what I was hoping for, what I was dreaming for, was just this dead oxidized skin on top of the paint. The best part about that, underneath, is this beautiful, rejuvenated, perfect, like baby skin underneath. And so what people don't sometimes think about is when you have oxidation on top, it actually acts as a blocker. It's kind of a good thing. It's, a, it's sort of just the sun beats it up, it dies, and then on, on, it just acts like a little bit of a raincoat, let's call it. And then as soon as you pull that raincoat off, you have this beautiful skin underneath. This is beautiful as far as I'm concerned. I couldn't ask for any better. I think we're gonna have to do maybe another step uh, to kind of compound it out and just kind of get a little bit of the a little marks here and there, but other than that, I mean, night and day difference. I'm super excited. This car is going to look absolutely stunning when we're done. As you know, with lots of dead oxidized paint comes lots of residue. When the pad gets full, you need to blow it out. As you can see here, the residue is shot out of the foam and onto the floor using compressed air. After the initial mow down of all the dead oxidized paint, we then switched to wool pads to remove the remaining scratches and deep imperfections in the paint. And after a few hours of doing that, of polishing and blowing out the pad and repeating that process, the floor looked like a Jackson Pollock painting. Okay, so we are finishing up the mow down technique again. That is just pulling off all the dead oxidized skin. As you can see, great example here. Look at the color of the floor. Obviously, that is the paint that's been removed. We blew it off the pad and, and it hits the floor. So that's a good example of mow down technique. Now, step number two is to use a wool pad with blue compound. That's gonna refine even deeper uh, what's left over. And you can see there's a little bit of swirls and things, totally normal for compound. Then we're gonna go to step three, which is polishing, and that's to remove the compounding marks. Now, if you come over here, you can see we actually did a test panel right here of the three steps. It looks absolutely fantastic. So all we have to do is repeat those three steps on the rest of the paint. I think this car is going to look absolutely stunning when we're done. With the 
yellow pad and yellow final polish now done, our three-step process for paint preservation is looking pretty good. For the tight areas, Dan is repeating the same three steps, but this time with smaller pads and tools to access the smaller areas around the badges and trim and so on, while the rest can be done by hand because it's single stage paint. Meanwhile, in the workshop across the way, Derek sprayed a light coating of rust neutralizer or metal edge solution, then lightly wire brushed to agitate the solution to loosen the surface debris. Next, he washed the surface to neutralize the acid etched solution and remove any remaining oils, then blew out the creases and crevices with compressed air before rewashing the surface yet again. Afterwards, he applied a light coating of self etching primer, scuffed lightly with a red Scotch Brite, then blew with air, washed the surface with cleaner, dried with compressed air again, and then masked the valve stems with tape and the tire with roof flashing, and finally applied three light coats of silver wheel paint for some fresh shoes. Later on after that, while everything was drying, he polished the hubcaps as well. So we were all sort of putting our own touches on the GT6, which was super fun. At or around the same time, we started the interior by removing anything that was left inside, including the removal of the seats, the hubcaps I mentioned earlier that Derek would be polishing, and of course the rear carpets, but underneath I found mold. All right, so this looks like there is a bit of mold on this what cardboard plasticky kind of thing so give me a little bit of uh, the background of is this dangerous can i remove it with just normal cleaners this should be just fine to clean up so uh, what a lot of people don't know is there's a lot of different types of mold um, but there's only one in particular that is very dangerous for you i don't think it's present here specky vitrous um, and so i think just a, a light cleaner will be able to take this off maybe with a microfiber and uh, yeah that should take care of it let's give it a go Oh yeah. Specky Dukakis. After removing all the mold and tossing out the towels, I vacuumed the interior while Dan was working the one inch polisher around the tight spots on the car. Inside, notice how faded the carpets have become over time due to what I presume is sun or UV exposure. Now check this out. We just removed the interior seat and there's something interesting going on. As soon as I pull the floor mat out, look at the color difference underneath the floor mat versus all the way around here. And it's heaviest on this side, which to me, it seems like the sun came in, hit here, and sort of oxidized this all out, faded it, and interior all the way up in there, same thing. It's, it's relatively clean, meaning that I don't think the sun got to it. The sun got to this area here, but obviously underneath the seat, which was right around here, looks pretty good. The area where the seat didn't cover right here obviously looks a little bit like it's worn, but not as worn as here, which got hit more. Now. Let's take it one step further. The back here, look how beautiful this carpet looks. There was a cover on here before. There was a bunch of junk and a bunch of stuff basically covering all of the light. What wasn't covered is this. Look at that right there. And as soon as you rub it, you can see some of the burned up, oxidized, however you want to describe it, sun beaten, sun weathered material flakes off. So we're going to vacuum the rest of this like I did right here. And it's going to turn black again. We're going to suck up all the old, just like the dead paint on the outside. I'm guessing that this is just old, dead carpet. Next, I used my steam vac, which is a steam machine combined with a wet vac type suction. It's completely ridiculous. This allows sensitive carpets to be steam cleaned without ever over soaking it and soaking the carpets and the cushions underneath like traditional shampoo machines sometimes do. It's perfect for areas that need to be cleaned but aren't completely destroyed or for light cleanups when a customer, let's say, is waiting in your shop and sitting on wet seats is a concern when they take the car home. So it's a handy tool for sure. Afterwards, I scrubbed the interior with ammo lather and an interior brush to remove the years of dust and grime. At the same time, Dan was buffing the front and rear bumpers by hand. Now check this out, we also polished the license plates that came back to almost new, which was really fun to see. Now at the same time, I also asked Derek to reinstall the seats, but not to look at the paint until we were done so that I could surprise him in a few minutes, you know, like an hour later, and he was a good sport about that, so that was kind of cool. While Dan was in the back rejuvenating the license plate, which I think was super fun, I started to degrease the engine with Titan 12, which has a pH level of 12 to remove the heavy greases and oils that have accumulated over the years. Now to do this safely, I used a single hole steam nozzle on the steam vac machine to avoid soaking an older engine with water, which of course we didn't even have. 
check out the before and after on the hoses. Not sure what was left on there, but whatever it was, it was super gross, and after an hour or so of scrubbing the engine, it looked way better. Afterwards, we cleaned the windows with Obey, a squeegee, and a razor blade. Now, these were incredibly difficult to clean because of the hard water stains, but the razor blade helps a lot in these super tough spots. Also keep in mind, uh, you can't use razor blades on the inside of the rear glass with the heater lines going across from left to right. They'll break the electrical current if you cut them, so don't forget that. I've done it a thousand times, and it's not a good look. Finally, we applied Ammo Reflex Pro to protect the freshly exfoliated paint and to slow future oxidation. On a quick side note, for those of you wondering, the floor has a few wet spots here and there because I poured bottled water and I sprayed a bit of frothy on the Jackson Pollock painting thing on the floor off camera and then scrubbed it and pushed it out the door before revealing the finished paint to Derek. I wanted everything to look really clean. With the wheels on and the car off the jack stands, the GT6 looks completely transformed. But I did ask Derek if he could get this thing started and in true Derek fashion, he responded with this. Two minutes. Two minutes? First, he installed a new battery and took the air filters off to access the carbs. Now, off camera, we were chatting a little bit, and I said, like, hey, dude, what is the actual chances of this thing starting? And he looked at me, he was like, 100%. And I was like, okay, that's a little bit optimistic. But with Dan inside turning the key Thank and Derek spraying the starting fluid into the carbs, this is what happened. <laughs> wow. What did I tell you? Two minutes. Two minutes. <laughs> With that huge success, we called it a night as it was super late and ridiculously cold. I cannot emphasize that enough. But the car, although not perfect, was in much better shape and ready for Derek's next step to get it back on the road once again. Now, while we were packing everything up, I couldn't help but take a look at the old Datsun with the animal prints on the windshield, as it looks like I might be back again real soon. So, as always, guys, thanks for watching, and be sure to subscribe and click the notification button so you don't miss out on the forgotten Porsche 928 video coming very soon. It was left outside uncovered for years. The transformation is insane. As always, guys, thanks for watching. Bye.